Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Shannon Derejo from Crema Media. Welcome to our webinar on South Africa's Renewable Energy Report Card and Investment Outlook, where our distinguished panel of speakers will unpack South Africa's renewable energy landscape as we approach the last quarter of 2024. Our webinar today is sponsored by NOAA Group and EY. We thank these companies for their support in making this event possible. Before we start, please note that we've activated the Q&A function for your questions. Please direct any questions to the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. While we may not get to every question during our hour together, rest assured, we will review each one. Additionally, the chat feature is enabled for your comments and insights. Look for it right next to the Q&A box. Remember though, questions should go into the Q&A to ensure that they're properly addressed in that section. Please also be informed that this webinar is being recorded and the recording will be made available to you afterwards. Also, we're broadcasting live on YouTube and the link will be shared in the chat once it becomes accessible. Thanks so much for your attention. Let's begin. Today's webinar will be facilitated by South African Wind Energy Association CEO, Naveshan Govinda. As the CEO at the association, Naveshan advocates for a thriving wind energy sector in South Africa with local participation and beneficiation at the heart of its development. Naveshan will facilitate the discussion with our panel, which consists of Bernard Magoro, head of the Independent Power Producers Office, Brian Day, the chairperson of the South African Independent Power Producers Association, Carl Cornelison, the CEO of NOAA Group, and Heather Orton, strategy and innovation leader at EY Parthenon. And without further ado, I'll hand over now to our facilitator to take the proceedings forward. Over to you, Naveshan. Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and thank you, Shannon, for the welcoming remark uh, and inviting me to moderate uh, this webinar today that's entitled uh, South Africa's Renewable Energy Report Card and Investment Outlook. Uh, as I've been introduced, my name is Naveshan Govinda. I am the CEO of SOWEA, the South African Wind Energy Association. SOWEA is a non-for-profit industry association representing the united voice of the wind sector and advocating for the advanced growth of wind energy in South Africa. India. We have an extremely esteemed panel of speakers today uh, who will unpack South Africa's renewable energy landscape and approach beyond 2024. My job is an easy one this afternoon to set the scene and ask the important questions really placing our experts in the hot seat. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, 2024 has witnessed several key policy changes most importantly in, South, in the South African context is our, ge our general elections being concluded, giving rise to the government of national unity under the seventh administration. With this, we saw the promulgation of the Climate Change Bill and the Electricity Regulation Act Amendment, both extremely important pieces of legislation that will change the energy market landscape and support the advancement of renewable energy. From my perspective, the government of national unity appears to be establishing a stable and effective framework and moving with pace when it comes to matters of energy transition with energy security in mind. I do think that there's still some work that needs to be done in the affordability. We should be encouraged by the consistent messaging uh, between, the, between President Ramaphosa and Minister of Energy and Electricity uh, Dr. Ramakopa in support of renewable energy. In his opening address to parliament, the president highlighted that South Africa is undergoing a renewable energy revolution, expected to be the most significant driver of growth and job creation in the next decade and beyond. Additionally, Minister Ramakopa has expressed his commitment to an ultra-aggressive approach to rolling out renewable energy, including plans for a mega bid window aimed at procuring renewables on an unprecedented scale. For the first time, it seems that government is showing coordinated support for the transition to renewable energy. With political will, sound policy and regulatory framework, private sector readiness and readily available funding, the market anticipates vastly accelerated implementation. If we can sort out the transmission infrastructure limitations, I myself will remain cautiously optimistic until such time as we see what happens in the future. 
with that context, um, we find ourselves at a stage of an ev evolving energy market. At this point, it is important for us to stop, take stock and reevaluate our strategic plans and our way forward. In taking stock of the Renewable Energy Report Card, we have established just over six gigawatts of installed capacity by 92 IPPs through the Renewable Energy IPP procurement program but window one to four. There are various public procurement programs, including the risk mitigation IPP procurement program, the Renewable Energy IPP procurement program but window five, six, and recently closed but window seven at different stages of procurement. Expected to implement some new capacity of wind and solar PV, but each of these programs with their own set of challenges. On a private procurement side, through the NERSA registration data, we understand that close to nine gigawatts of, of wind and solar PV projects have been registered. And from our market intelligence, some four to six gigawatts already in construction space. Additionally, we have seen a wave of rooftop solar um, installations flooding the market with an estimated three gigawatts of embedded solar PV already installed in the country. As you can see, ladies and gentlemen, a lot has been done, but a lot more needs to be done as we transition with affordable, accessible energy security in mind. To help me take stock, let me invite our panelists into the conversation for their opening. Panelists, if I can ask that you please introduce yourselves, uh, provide introductory remarks on the topic, and please feel free to include any key renewable energy achievements as part of this report card from your perspective to set the scene for the rest of the conversation. If I can start uh, with Mr. Bernard Mc. Thank you, Nivesh, and uh, good afternoon to uh, everyone that joined us this afternoon. My name is Bernard Magoro. I'm the head of the IPP office, and thank you very much for inviting us, uh, Klima Media. Yes, um, Nivesh, yes, you have touched on the, on the achievements. Uh, well, they, you've missed quite a few, which I think it's, it's probably important to reiterate as well. So we, we, we definitely have come a long way as South Africa in the last um, 14, 15 years that we started with this process. Uh, from the public procurement uh, side, um, yes, you touched on the 6.4 gigawatt that's currently in operation. We still have another 2 gigawatt that's currently under construction, which we are estimating 700 of that to come online before the end of this financial year. Uh, and over and above that, we've got um, the battery storage program, our first battery storage program, which um, we announced last year, December. Those projects should be reaching commercial close in the next few months as well. Um, and then because this is about the investment as well, it's also important to mention that out of all these programs, we have attracted close to 300 billion rand worth of private sector investment in the industry. Um, but it doesn't end there. You, you touched on Bid Window 7. Also important to highlight the level of interest that we have seen uh, I think it's beyond our expectation. We have attracted uh, 10, over 10 gigawatts uh, of subscription for Bid Window 7, where we're looking for 5,000 megawatts. So yeah, the level of interest in South Africa remains very high, and, and we are very excited as the IPP office with um, the, 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 the um, commitment that we have seen from our investors across the value chain in our public procurement space. But yeah, let me stop here for now. But yes, just to emphasize that we have achieved quite a lot, but there's definitely a lot more that still needs to be done. And later on, maybe we'll touch on some of the uh, projects that are coming later on. Thanks. Thank you so much, Bernard. Uh, Brian, can I please have a reach? Thank you very much, Navishan, and good afternoon to everybody. My name is Brian Day, and I have the privilege of chairing the South African Independent Power Producers Association. Uh, been going for 15 years, established in 2009, and focused very much across all technologies, looking at policy and regulatory space uh, in, in order to um, facilitate and enable greater participation uh, by private generators in the sector. Thank you very much for the um, introduction, uh, Navesh, and I think the 
the key um, achievements for me is is building on the Schedule 2 um, amendment that was made under the previous Electricity Regulation Act. Well, actually, it's still the current one, even though the new one's signed, but it's not implemented yet. But, um, you know, there, there were very few people who believed that the level of generation uh, that has been um, in, or is being invested in, that has been uh, constructed, that has been contracted, um, is, is enormous. And you've covered some of those, those figures. It, it's also better facilitated um, prosumers, so those who produce and um, consume electricity. Um, one of the big challenges for us is that the opportunity for cogeneration is still uh, fallen by the wayside. Um, the, the, the previous RP had, had a, a other technologies column, the, the last column in table five of that RP, and that was unfortunately misused uh, in a, a section 34 determination for the risk mitigation program and cogen biomass and other technologies have, have not been able to be procured by the IPP office as a result of that. Um, th that is something that I think will be uh, facilitated better by the market, but I think that's an, an issue that is coming up in the next um, section. Um, I, I would also like to look at um, the importance of, of understanding the difference between procuring of energy only um, renewable energy uh, type of type of projects, take or pay arrangements, and the bigger uh, issue around balancing of the grid. Uh, time of day, uh, backup, uh, and all of those things, I think, are, are important uh, comments and um, will come to play um, uh, very soon. Um, and then just to talk briefly on municipalities, I think there's massive progress on a very small number of municipalities, City of Cape Town, some others in, in the Western Cape uh, at the forefront, um, Ekuleni, um, and in fact, just a week or two ago, uh, Chwane Council has um, approved an SSEG and wheeling framework to be issued for public comment, and that should in fact be available um, potentially by the end of this week, uh, along with the um, process of, of such public comment. Um, and of course, uh, those processes, along with cost of supply studies, those wheeling frameworks, and the, the, the importance of NURSA coming to the party um, and, and playing their role, uh, is is of great importance for the industry. I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Brian. Uh, Heather, what can I have? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I suppose for me, the thing that it encourages, because I'm looking at it from the perspective of businesses, what I'm seeing happening is the increased competition. So we're getting a lot of requests for market analysis to look at both new entrants into the market, but also how existing uh, entrants kind of maintain uh, their, their market share. So I do think that's encouraging. Um, I think the next one for me is, is, is the increased reliability that we're getting. Uh, I think everyone here yeah, celebrated, you know, 100 days of no load shedding. Uh, and obviously, this has a huge impact on business because, uh, you know, there were lots of big numbers being thrown around about what businesses, especially small to medium businesses, are losing every time they have to shut shut the doors. And then the last one um, I wanted to touch on was the investment portfolio. So we are seeing an increase in investment. Uh, and the stat I kind of looked at was the amount of imports for solar panels. And in 2023, that rose from a figure of 100 million USD to 450 million USD. So quite a significant jump, which implies that it is encouraging the right behavior and we are seeing that translate into uh, income. Thank you so much, Heather. Yes, celebrating 165 days of no load shift. We're really doing well. Uh, Carol, please, can I have your introduction? Yeah, good afternoon, and thank you very much, um, Vision. Um, my name is Carol Cornelison. I'm the CEO and co-founder of NOAA, uh, a business that was started in 2022. Um, and I think what I want to... Um, comment on a little bit is um, firstly acknowledging the, the great work that was done over the last 10, 15 years, um, acknowledging the great work and construction that is that is happening right now. Um, but I would probably um, 
try to channel my comments to a slightly more forward-looking picture. So Noah, just maybe as a side comment, um, our name was derived from, um, from an ideal of a net zero Africa. Um, so I think the name gives away what, um, what we are passionate about. Um, so if we look forward, um, and we, we typically try and look forward um, by multiple decades. So if we can imagine ourselves in the year 2050 and, um, and we can look back at the commitments that we've made at, at several COPs and where we then need to be as a as a as a global planet and uh, and South Africa in that context, our view is that that um, that we should have constructed in the order of 150 gigawatts of renewable um, energy over the over the next 25 years. Now it's always valuable for me to put these things into perspective. So if we said that we have constructed six gigawatts over the last decade, and we look forward. And we think that we need to construct 150 gigawatts in 25 years. The simple mathematics means we need to construct six gigawatts of renewables every year, starting this year, for the next 25 years. And if one then acknowledges that the typical life of plant is about 25 years, then the plants that we are constructing this year, in year 26, we will have to reconstruct these plants. So, so South Africa is probably on a perpetual building cycle now of an incredible amount of infrastructure. And I think our president used language like a demonstrous scale of infrastructure development and construction that's going to happen in the country. So I think if we look through those lenses, um, maybe it helps people to understand just the scale of investment and uh, construction activity that is gonna 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 happen here in South Africa, and hopefully it's gonna help to significantly unlock our um, our economy. That's our view. Thank you very much, Carol, and thank you, panelists. I think that gives us a good context on how we have scored on our renewable energy investment report card. Uh, I personally would rate that as a merit path. Uh, there's a lot more that needs to be done and a lot quicker. Uh, and I think we all need to get working towards it uh, as Carol has offlined. I want to move on, um, colleagues, uh, to the ERA Amendment Bill. Um, and that will set the tone for, for future investments in, into the electricity and energy landscape. So in August this year, the, the energy sector celebrated the Electricity Regulation Act Amendment Bill being promulgated, uh, the amendment bill sets out to create a competitive and sustainable electricity sector uh, to transform and ultimately better capacitate the energy sector to meet our energy needs as a country. Uh, at its core, the amendment bill supports energy security with more participation and changed management uh, to advance universal access to energy. The bill seeks to create an electricity industry with a multi-market structure that will enable competition, uh, be managed by a transmission system operator, and will create a fair and transparent platform for the purchase of electricity, uh, also ensuring that oversight and regulation by the regulator is in place. For renewable energy, the bill seeks to open access to the grid, which will facilitate a lot more investment into the sector. This supports uh, to support this, the bill will also direct a national framing, uh, a national fr a framework for wheeling, which which Brian has touched on, uh, which is the actually the distribution of electricity between IPP and uh, private uptakers uh, on a inter interprovincial level. So this, in a nutshell, panelists, is the confirmation of an electricity market reform with the new and changing conditions uh, coming into play. While we review this particular policy update, there are unintended consequences that we have seen uh, from, a, from the municipal response to the bill. But there are also vast opportunities for various stakeholders around the energy table. So I'd love to get your view on this policy change particularly. Um, and given the perspective of where you come from, so Bernard, can we get your views uh, from, a public perspective, from a public procurement perspective uh, especially given the challenges that we saw in Bid Window 6 and Bid Window 7 with wind energy 
uh, given the constrained bridge that, that we are facing. Over there. Thank you, Nivesh. Um, look, on, on this topic, I think it's a, very, um, it's, it's a very exciting times for us as well. If you look at the bill, there's always been questions, you know, what's the role of public procurement going forward? And I think if one looks at the amendments that have been made, particularly to Section 34, uh, it's very clear that public procurement will still play a key role in making sure that security of supply in South Africa, even after liberalization, is not compromised. And that's, that, to me, is the key um, as far as you know, the national interest and the public procurement is concerned. It's very clear that the minister can make a determination to make sure there is security of supply um, if there is um, you know, a case of market failure. So for me, that, that, that is key. Uh, then what that means is that um, we must constantly monitor market development and respond accordingly as government. Uh, unfortunately, we're dealing with infrastructure which requires, which is a long lead time. So um, it, it's, it means all of us as uh, procurers, as the system operator, and the minister, we have to constantly look at the system and see what do we need in the next 10, 15, 20 years. And that's where the IRP also comes in. But the other important aspect that, um, again, under the same section, for the first time, um, the minister can make a determination with regard to transmission infrastructure. Um, and, and that has been a bottleneck. And it's not just for the private sector. I think all of us are now struggling to secure the grid for the much-needed electricity. So the, the Act requires the minister to constantly look at that as well and issue determinations that can also speak to either transmission infrastructure in isolation to facilitate generation connection, of course, but can also be a combination of both of them. So he can issue a determination that says we need this generation capacity, but to give effect to it, we also need to get this transmission uh, infrastructure installed. So for me, those two are actually the key um, outcomes from, from this new act, which I think it, it sets uh, the tone and it also provides much needed clarity on future private sector investment in the sector. Absolutely. Uh, thanks, Bernard. And I think a lot of people are seeing the conflict or competition between public procurement and private procurement, but really what we need is for both these programs to work together to ensure that we can roll out and accelerate uh, renewable energy investment in the country. Brian, coming to you, um, we saw last year, you know, between six and eight gigawatts of private projects take up grid capacity uh, in the same time around grid window six. Uh, how is this policy paper going to support, you know, the acceleration of these projects, the closure of these projects as moving forward with these yeah, thank you very much, um, Navesh. And I think the the passing of the bill um, by both houses of parliament um, before the end of the sixth um, parliament uh, and and the elections this year was one of the most outstanding pieces of of work from government in terms of expediting that process. So enormous plaudits to them. I really did not think it was was possible. I'm normally a real optimist too, so so uh, I think that that really needs to be acknowledged. The NECOM guys, Energy Council, the other associations, uh, Operation Volendlela, uh, Presidency, all of all of the people who've worked worked so hard. Um, <clears throat> I might also say at long jolly last, because it's not like a new idea. Um, you know, you go back to the the white paper of 1998, and I, and I don't I don't want to be the one that cause cold water and all the optimism uh, because the optimum optimism is is well placed having spoken to people in the political space and the the very frank appreciation across the political parties of the abilities and convictions and some of our uh, cooperation if you like is 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 shared across the dif different political parties in in the government of national unity and that's I, I think actually profound. Um, Nivesh, you, you, you opened with, with the GNU um, uh, issues because too often in politics and in life, and especially in social media, our focus is on where we disagree with people. We listen only long enough to formulate our next comment. Um, 
we, we now have an opportunity. The GNU is actually forced to look at where they agree. And, and actually, it's 90 percent plus across political parties that seemingly are at loggerheads with each other because that's the nature of politics. And, and now it's a case of sit down and, and, and come up with something. And, and yes, there's still going to be those, those areas. But I think as people for the country, it'll be profound. So, um, <clears throat> but, but in, in terms of the uh, private versus public procurement, uh, I, I think there's the, the biggest thing that's happening at the moment is the work that the NTCSA is doing, the National Transmission Company of South Africa. And I, and I purposely don't call them ESCOM. ESCOM's their parent company. They, they have a very, very different role of the other elements of, of ESCOM. So they're not just ESCOM anymore. So I think our language in terms of how we refer to the NTCSA is, is important. And, and just yesterday, they had, I think it was the seventh or the eighth workshop on the market codes, because that is the rubber hitting the road on, on how the market is actually going to work. And, and that's the, the, the important thing. Um, and, and in fact, I had the privilege yesterday of, of um, meeting um, Priscilla Mabalani, uh, not yesterday, on Saturday at, a, at, a, at an event where I spoke on a uh, woman in energy. Uh, yes, I, I saw you there. And, and just hearing some of the expertise on the board of the NTCSA, the guys who've been in this industry for decades, who know stuff, and the passion to form the market, there's a real understanding that, yes, we've got to build grid. And we can talk about that in, in, in one of the next sections. But until and unless you get the market happening, um, you, you're going to be continually constrained. And I think that also is important in terms of how the RPP office is starting already to morph their, their focus beyond just energy. Battery storage, Bernard sp spoke about that uh, that first round is looking to, to, to reach commercial close. And I see that the, the market failure um, aspect is probably going to be more about um, uh, backup and and storage than it is going to be about energy itself. And therefore, public procurement need is probably going to play a bigger role when it comes to um, a, a capacity and, and backup. Because it's almost easy for, for us as renewables guys to, to have a take or pay. Uh, when the sun shines, you get what you can, but, you know, ESCA must do the, do the rest. And of course, ESCOM is the NCCSA plus the generators and, and all of that. So it's it's how that all um, comes together um, that actually uh, forms a, a sustainable um, electricity supply industry in the country. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Brian. Uh, you raised a good point that we have to be working together. And I think you've articulated well the NTCSA's, ro NTCSA's role uh, and what they're doing and how they're gearing up themselves to move us forward. Uh, I will come back to you because I, I, I do want us to talk about what is private sector role, what are the IPP's role in this, in this uh, matter. But I'll ask you that as a follow-up question a little bit later on, just for you to think about, you know, what can private sector do to support NTCSA, to support the IPP office, to support the government? In this way? Carol, um, you know, this this policy is supposed to open up this this free market, this liberalization of the energy sector. Does the policy actually do that? So does it give us this free market? And if it does, what kind of new investment, you know, can we expect to be attracted through this policy? Yeah, so the short answer is um, it absolutely does. Um, I think I have to steal from um, from what happened on Saturday um, in a in a very famous um, uh, sports event, and maybe just describe in in the analogy of sport how, how we see the ERA and the role it plays. So so I think for for us as a as a competitor in a in a, in the energy sector, um, I think competition is absolutely uh, essential for the market. Um, I think we have all experienced um, high rising energy costs. I think it's been well documented, but but we are of the opinion that with um, with where technologies are today, that that we over time should aspire to a world where the cost of energy is going to become affordable and abundant again. So. So if at the core of that objective, um, if, if, if you have competition there, 
then I think we can think about these important aspects that we've described in the context of a sport analogy. So, so I would say the players in the ecosystem are the, are the various generators. Um, so, so in order to have competition, you need to have multiple generators that can compete with each other and can be kept honest um, to put the sharpest um, um, possible energy on the grid for the, for the consumers. I think in a sports game, you also need to have the, the playing fields where these competitors can compete. And for me, that's that's the wires in the system or the grid. So the national transmission company has got a critical role to play to create these playing fields that will allow for competition to, to come and play the game and produce our best game, which, again, with the ultimate objective, the uh, affordable and sustainable energy prices to the consumer. I think the third, the third critical player in this ecosystem, so to speak, for me is the TSO. So they need to be the referee. I think all of us, um, well, hopefully all South Africans, will will always try and do the, what we believe is the best. But we all have a slightly um, um, limited view of what we believe the ultimate answer is. So I think you need a referee to ultimately balance the system and to make sure that what we want to put on the grid is is matched well with what the end consumer needs and that that the pricing is is regulated in such a way that it is a truly balanced and a balanced responsible market and for me the the era and the emerging market codes that that's sort of the rule book um of the of the industry and i think that rule book is absolutely critical given the quantum of investments that um, that that we as an economy need to make into this industry. Um, I, I at the start in my comment referred to sort of the quantum of gigawatts that needs to be implemented. Our estimate is that we are looking at somewhere between three and four trillion rands of investments that's required to um, to build the energy um, infrastructure of tomorrow. Now, in most people's world or language. Those are big quantums of capital that needs to be invested. And I think the second thing is your investment cycles are long cycles. So I think your capital allocators need to have the certainty um, and the clarity around where the industry is transitioning and what are the rules that will guide how this game is going to be played. So for me, the ERA provides a critical framework um, to, to enable this um, this game to be played, I think all the ingredients are there to, to really um, foster a fantastic um, industry, an industry that can work together, but also com can compete together. Um, and we are very excited about the strong signals that are sent out in the, in the ERA. And we're looking forward to getting more clarity on the market codes. And, um, and yeah, I think from a private sector perspective, we would be ready to participate. Awesome. No matter you know who the players are, what the rules are, what the game is, green and gold must come out. Number one. <laughs> so South Africa must win. Um, Heather, you Absolutely. know when we have, and when we have this conversation, we're very much always talking from an industry perspective. You know, IPPs as as wind industry, as solar industry, as aggregators, how are we participating. I, I really like that you're on this panel because you you bring a new dimension of the other side because it extends far greater than just the industry. It extends to business and businesses, the impact on business. So from that perspective, how is this policy going to further enable sustainable business practices in meeting you know, the increased pressure of ESG compliance and ESG reporting and ESG um, requirements as we move? Thanks, Navishan. So, I mean, from my perspective, I think historically, uh, the narrative has really been about energy security. Uh, and a lot of the um, organizations that have invested, um, it's really been around mitigating the energy crisis uh, and making sure that they have energy independence, uh, because there's lots of benefits that they get from that. Um, one of those being that sort of constant production, constant revenue stream. Uh, I think a huge secondary driver uh, is, the, you know, we're seeing a huge change in internet 
international regulation. Um, and so international trading partners and investors are really driving the demand for renewable energy adoption. Um, and the one I wanted to cite was, was the carbon border uh, adjustment mechanism, where you know there's going to start to be those carbon tariffs uh, for everything that we make and export. And I think, again, this, this um, amendment really fosters an environment where we can start to make that transition. Uh, and obviously we can still then potentially export a, a large percentage of our products. I think the last one um, is really around uh, you know, particular industries like retail, financial services, mining, uh, and you'll see that the mining companies have have already invested in large scale projects for generations. So organizations like Anglo, Savanier, they're all looking at how they can get their energy independence, uh, but also how they can serve the communities around them, which again is where this policy really comes into play. And I think that's where it really helps to uh, support the ESG narrative, as you said. And, and I think it's more than that. Um, I think in order to achieve investment now, whether it's debt finance or equity finance, you do need to have thought about how you can be a responsible business. And again, the move to renewable energy really helps you primarily with your scope two emissions um, and ultimately your scope three emissions. But fundamentally, the consumers are becoming way more savvy as to you know, who they want to work for, who they want to work with, and who they want to buy from. And again, I think this agenda is helping a lot of organizations move to and maintain some of their kind of key product and service offerings. Thank you very much, uh, Heather. Uh, you know, I was at the EU ambassador's house this week. Uh, having this conversation around CBAM uh, and really picking up that, you know, it has its own challenges and the implications on business is, is, is wide and vast. And we really need to tighten up, you know, how we're looking at CBAM and how CBAM is affecting business in South Africa for us to be sustainable and actually move that forward. But that's a whole nother conversation. Let me yeah, start. I, st start <laughs> uh, I, I think, you know, the policy certainty is only the first step. So, as much as this ERA amendment bill is giving us that, that certainty, it's only the first step. As government and private sector, we need to align particularly on practicalities of implementing this policy and implementation to move renewable energy or accelerate renewable energy. So panelists, you know, this then unpacks a whole new list of opportunities and challenges facing the advancement of or the acceleration of renewable energy. So Heather, you know, staying with you uh, and the business aspect, what uptake are you seeing by South African businesses since these regulations have been opened? Not just the ERA amendment bill, but also the schedule two that Brian spoke about, allowing for private investment in electricity generation. Sorry, Innovation, I might need you to ask that again because the lights went off and I got very distracted about getting the lights back on. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's quite pertinent when we're talking about renewable energy that my lights go out. <laughs> no, sure. I'm just asking from a, from a business perspective, you know, what uptake are we seeing from South African businesses since the, the change in regulations uh, allowing for increased private sector investment uh, in electricity generation? Yeah, so I think I touched on a couple of the projects that we've seen um, already. Um, so definitely, I would say the large manufacturing, what I would call typically carbon intensive industries are heavily investing in securing their own energy. And, and through that, they, you know, there's sort of ancillary benefits for the communities that they work with. Um, I think uh, Bernard mentioned some of the challenges around that actually is the transmission network and, and being able to... Um, actually transport those electrons from where they're being generated to where they need to be. But I think one of my key kind of interesting things is that in the last year, we've seen uh, four trading licenses awarded by NERSA uh, to, to uh, independent power producers or, or trading organizations. And for me, that is an indication that uh, the, I think the market is changing and we're seeing not only more organizations looking at ways to generate their own power, but then how to trade that that power. Um, I think another point is that um, I've just lost my train of thought. Uh, but yeah, so so give me a second. Uh, I think we're also seeing an increase in in PPAs, and I know one of our panelists is going to talk about that. Um, and 
I think one of the challenges for me when businesses start to look at how they generate their energy or how they federate their energy is is choosing the right solution. And and we've talked, and and for me, that's also geographically quite interesting because we've seen a, a lot of our clients in um, in the Gauteng, Johannesburg re region, kind of investing in, in rooftop solar uh, and things like that. Um, but then our sort of Northern Cape are looking at sort of wind generation. And, and I think the other challenge at the moment is they have to be quite close to the generation as well. So organizations where I'm seeing invest in it uh, the the transmission cycle is usually within their control. Uh, it's something that they can generate and use at the same time. Uh, and so I do think that when we do start to uh, evolve our transmission network, it's going to be an interesting conversation to see how uh, those organizations um, adapt. Uh, uh, the mining companies are already saying, you know, can they actually sell some of their land to others or solar generation, uh, but again, there's still that transmission challenge because yes, we can generate it, but then can we transport it to where it needs to be? So very much, I would say, localized considerations with 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 businesses at the moment, but sort of starting to think about you know the bigger picture. Thank you so much, Heather. Uh, Bernard, given the policy setting that we're talking about, the reality is that there is increased competition. Uh, and the liberalization of the market is, is changing the landscape. So meaning that we're going to have to really look at how we're procuring energy. From your perspective, what is the strategy in how we are positioning public procurement? What is, what is the role of the IPP office in this evolving market? Um, you know, noting that the, the process as it, as it was previously may not be fit for purpose in this mm -hmm. evolving market. What, what's the strategy to move us forward? Thanks, thanks, Nivesh. Uh, I think that is the reality we have to accept. Um, the future is going to be completely different from how we have done things in the past. We saw it with Bidwindow um, 5, uh, Bidwindow 6. In fact, even Bidwindow 5, some of the outcomes were already giving us signals of the changing landscape. So, I mean, if, if one can just touch on what is the current reality. Uh, we've got a scarce grid that we're all trying to grab. Uh, the rules that served us back then in terms of grid allocation, grid competition that we used to run as the IPP office, that process cannot function anymore. So we need to find um, an alternative solution to that. Um, and then you look at curtailment that has been introduced. Now we are waiting for the regulator to, to, to make a call on that. But over and above that, um, the structure of the PPAs cannot be the same. Um, already within the IPP office, we are looking at what, what the future PPAs should look like. How do we incorporate the requirements of the system operator? Because clearly, um, we need to start looking at what the system requires. Uh, when we talk about the market failure, uh, somebody touched on it. Maybe it's not an energy challenge that we have now, it's a capacity challenge. And everyone in the world is now really going into the capacity markets because of the uh, of trying to balance the renewables. So the, the answer to your question is that the future will be different. And this platform with the new era just gives us um, a clarity in terms of how do we set ourselves and responding to to this uh, uh, new environment that we find ourselves in. I've already touched on the, on the opportunity that comes with tr transmission determination. So that is clear. And hopefully that, that, um, that will be brought to, to, to live as well very soon. Uh, but the most important one, which we didn't touch during the opening, um, let's not leave others behind. It's very exciting to have the market but South Africa is a completely different setup from Europe, from US. So as we move into implementing ERA and market liberalization, I think it's important that the, the legislation is a framework. So we need those regulations. The market code is there, but we need regulations that make sure that South Africa benefits out of this transition. Uh, the 200 gigawatt of renewables or 155 gigawatt of renewables, uh, it will be said if 10 years, 15 years from now, uh, we've got nothing sustainable to show for it in terms of taking care of our poor communities, um, you know, creating manufacturing opportunities, 
developing skills that we will need. Uh, and I think it's Kara who mentioned, this is going to continue to perpetuate as we see today. Uh, but are we going to create industries that will, you know, save South Africa in the future in, instead of importing all these components? So yeah, from our side, we're looking at, you know, how do we redesign the, the, the procurement model to respond to what ERA is asking for, um, but also helping government with other, you know, economic development initiatives as well. Thanks, Bernard. Homegrown solutions that work for us. Uh, Brian, when we talk renewable energy acceleration, we need to talk grid capacity. Um, so from your perspective, you know, what can we do to move this forward? And I think in your response, if you if you'd be so kind, you know, to touch on the short term options as well, you know, while we're waiting for the infrastructure build, which is going to take a few years, the short term options, Bernard spoke about curtailment, we have the storage procurement rounds going, you know, the wheeling framework is coming. Can you can you touch on a little bit of, of, of those aspects uh, within the energy sector? No, I think Thanks very much, and 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 I think you know it, it comes on the back of the uh, uh, some of Bernard's comments around <clears throat> the importance of using the best of models around the world to make sure that we've got competition, which which breeds uh, the, the right behaviour, um, but to understand that um, electricity an electricity market is not a free market. And I would define a free market as something that is, uh, and I use the example of pencils for no other reason than there's lots of them. I don't well, I use I use pencils or pens. I don't know if today's youth do. It's all electronic, but but you can have, you know, economics 101 requires you to have an infinite number of producers and an infinite number of customers, and therefore the choice is is available. The time lag to build new capacity. The logistics chain, all of the things that 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 are assumed when you study economics in first year and you have a supply and a demand curve, you don't have that in 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 um, uh, in electricity. Bernard mentioned the time lag of, of big infrastructure, and so we must not be afraid of using the term market failure uh, or, or market deficiency um, because it's 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 inevitable. I would also emphasize the difference between the wholesale market which is what the era actually brings in. And other countries in Europe, Denmark, et cetera, that have gone way ahead into a retail market. And I think it's in the retail market where we must be more cautious because we, we, we're not ready and, uh, and I think too many people will be left behind. A wholesale market, I don't think that's, that's really the case at all. And, and, if, you, and if you have the appropriate uh, tariff structure and support for indigent households and that, that gets right through to the right people. And it goes right into municipal funding, fiscal frameworks, and all of those complexities around that um, th th that is important. But to get to, to grid specifically, and I've been talking short-term, medium, and long-term in terms of grid capacity. Curtailment is, is absolutely the short-term. And in fact, nobody can build grid that hasn't been started already in the next two or three three years. That's assuming that you've got the servitudes, you've got the designs, you've got everything else, else happening. So, so let's not kid ourselves with fancy plans um, because as a country, we tend to be really good at plans and really bad at implementation. So, so as you will know, the curtailment framework that's been proposed is, is sitting with NERSA uh, I think nurses' job is changing, developing probably faster than they've been capacitated to be able to achieve. And, and I think that's a, a, a massive risk for, for, for the industry because, you know, you, you suddenly have, a, have an era, you've got market codes, you've got all, all of the things. That the role of nurse uh, grows and develops um, uh, quite a lot. So absolutely curtailment is, is the, um, the short-term option along with, uh, storage elements and of course the RPP offices uh, battery energy storage round is very targeted with input from Eskom as to where those batteries are going to be put because it's not just about an energy storage uh, macro issue it's an evacuation challenge time of day 
opening up. It, it's almost like like I, I liken the, the the evacuation capacity to how many lanes you've got on a freeway, and the connection capacity to your on ramps. So so your substation transformers is like on ramps, and your 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 evacuation capacity, your wires is 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 how many um, lanes you've got. And and unfortunately, wind and and even more so PV. Uh, it's generated when it's generated. Now, now that's 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 mostly okay, but you need to deal with it in terms of 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 and and essentially having the battery there. You create a nighttime lane open that otherwise wouldn't isn't possible. So 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 the 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 and and the, and the Munichs can do a lot of this as well to 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 postpone and delay infrastructure on their main incoming substations as well. Battery energy storage on the in, inside of, of, of that so that you um, import electricity both at night from Eskom and and during the day from, from private RPPs, um, the renewables guys, and then you dispatch in peaks and other times when, when, when you need it. In the medium term, I see the NCCSA needing to fundamentally change their uh, contracting strategy to, to an EPC model. In, in FIDIC Silver Book, uh, turnkey is the, the terminology. They are starting to do it, but I don't think it's really at the speed yet that, that, that is needed. And in fact, you were you were at a previous event that uh, Cyper and Palasa, the um, uh, Powerline and Substation Association, co-hosted um, at the other country club that didn't have a fire yesterday. Um, and 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 the last two slides of Sefa Moko Skepper's um, presentation was much more detailed than I'd seen before in terms of what the plans are, um, the, the tangible plans of not just the big um, big projects, the, the 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 things that change fundamentally, but there's so many areas where they know that smaller work can unlock a, a lot of benefit, and, and that's what they, they they're looking at, but. You can't wait for Eskom to do the design and then get through procurement and then appoint a contractor and, and all of that. It has to be write a proper specification, have a competitive round, all the right tender processes and all of that, and, and have people to come and build it. They have, of course, made progress in, in setting up the panels of, of, of people who've qualified to, 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 to do this. So so due credit to them, but, but that really is that. But but not an awful lot of that can can happen in even in the next two to three years. In fact, I read a story that in the next three years they were hoping to build 800 kilometers of of transmission network. Now and of course the associated um, uh, 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 substations transformers. Now 800 sounds like a lot, and it's it's way bigger than 74.4 in the last financial year. Um, but it's still only just more than half what we need to do per year. So it's about seven months worth that, that that the plan currently is to build in 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 three years. Not enough. We 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 have to find ways to to build more. What people spend more of their time talking about though is the long term solutions, which is the concession model, build and operate, transfer, uh, an independent transmission office, whatever, whoever's going to do it. The National Treasury has been looking at it, but if you read between the lines, it's a pilot project. That should start in 18 months. So we're not going to see any of the benefit of that in five or seven years. That's that's the reality. And 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 mark my words, uh, uh, third quarter of 2024. Um, and and that's and and I'm not suggesting that any less effort should be put into that, because when that time comes, we need it to be working well and and to be able to make the most of private sector funding. Uh, without denuding the fiscus who have other op um, obligations. So, so the short term and the medium term um, have to be worked at at equal importance and vigor, as well as the, the, the long term solutions. Thank you very much, Brian. I think that, uh, you know, I've seen a lot of questions in the Q&A function around the grid infrastructure, around uh, grid capacity. So you've answered or you've managed to address a number of that. Thank you very much. I also like the fact that you looked at me when you talked about the young people and the young generation, but not to disappoint you, I still use a pen and it's a big pen, so you can just imagine them. Uh, but thank you for that. Uh, Carol, enter aggregators and traders into the mix, okay? Uh, energy aggregators and, and traders are becoming increasingly visible as part of the renewable energy sector. And that's spoken about the four trading licenses that have been approved uh, already. 
share with us some of the opportunities and challenges that you face uh, as we include and integrate traders and aggregators into the trading. Yeah, no, thank you very much. Um, so I think maybe touching a little bit on, on, on some of our great challenges, I think uh, what is required is a collective effort um, to to solve these um, these issues. Um, and I think as as IPPs, there is a critical role to be played. And I think happy to report that I think many IPPs are already playing those roles. By what I would say, keep increasing the self built scopes that IPPs are willing to take on. So there are increasingly more, um, I would say, grid upgrades. Um, or deep bottlenecking that is taking place as part of these um, of these large infrastructure projects, and which I think is a critical component to help to contribute to the overall grid solution. The challenge, I think, when you are talking about um, taking on additional scope as an IPP, is it does come with a with a fair bit of additional cost. Uh, that you now need to amortize over the electricity that you're going to sell. And the best way to do that is to just build really very large wind or solar facilities. Um, I think in the very early days of the of the of the reprograms, we were building maybe 10, 20 megawatt solar facilities. Later on the standard became 75. And I think in the latest two procurement rounds, we, we're sitting at 240 odd megawatts of facilities being built or, or bit at a, at a time. And, and I suspect that we call them clusters. I suspect that those clusters are, are just going to get bigger and bigger. And I think if you get past a certain critical mass on a cluster, you can actually absorb quite a lot of, of grid work. Now, the challenge is mostly um, in, a, in, a, in a, call it in some form of a bilateral world, you need to find both a customer that is willing to buy the power and you need to have the generator that is, that is willing to build a very large scale cluster. Now, the challenge become these clusters are so big that there are very few single customers that can actually buy that amount of power. In fact, you might almost say you can count them on one hand, the, the number of single customers that can buy at 500 megawatts or a gigawatt of power on a, on a single procurement route. Now, I think this is maybe where aggregators are entering into the market, where we are playing the role of aggregating a lot of smaller customers so that in aggregation, we can present a large pool of off takers to IPPs, which then in turn will allow them to build very large scale infrastructure. It will, it will enable cost to be the most competitive because renewables scale quite significantly with size. And secondly, as you talk about really large scale facilities, um, you, you are also in a position to actually contribute quite a bit towards some um, certain good updates that would be required to, to evacuate that, that energy um, onto the grid. Um, so I think that's that's one role that an aggregator is supposed to to play, and I think that the aggregators are are exactly doing that. I think a second a second form of aggregation is also on the electron side. So I think in order to provide our customers with um, with energy, not only during daytime when the sun is shining, but for twenty four hours a day. I think there is a, is a tricky balance between the various technologies that one needs to, to get right. So I think as aggregators, we are also really thinking carefully, what is the right mix of wind energy, solar energy, battery storage, to make sure that we can present the correct energy profile to the customers that, that, um, that we are targeting. And maybe the final point that I would make Back maybe to the to the whole grid challenge. Um, if you sit with a very constrained resource um, or capability like grid, I think one has to think really um, out of the box of how to optimize whatever you have. I think we've mentioned um, curtailment or the critical role that curtailment can play. 
I completely agree the role that storage can play to help um, create extra lanes. I think there's also a next wave that we will probably see where people start co-locating more of these technologies um, connecting to the same grid. So, for example, where you can have a fairly large scale solar facility and a wind facility and some battery storage all in one in one cluster. That will allow you when you evacuate onto the grid that you can potentially have the maximum use of the available grid capacity. So I think the, the constraints are always challenging to deal with. Um, but sometimes in life, the obstacle is actually the way. So I think the fact that that um, that we have a constrained grid, I think actually allows a lot of creative people to, to think how can we maximize what we have. And I think um, that's that's a critical ingredient to um, to, to help unlock the, the, the current challenge. Great, uh, thank you very much, Carol. Yeah, co-location is becoming more and, and more increasingly important. And I think what was um, what was interesting for us to see is that ESCOM is leading us uh, in co-location yeah. where we saw the yeah. tender for the PV uh, plant coming up at Siri Wind Farm, uh, really looking yes. at the co-location model. Thank you very much, colleagues. We are running out of time, so I want to wrap it up. Uh, last, last round of questions. Um, I think it's important for you, for us to look at the, the outlook, the future outlook over the next three to five years, where we're we going. So, you know, we've seen earlier this year, the draft IRP 2023, it was, it had several flaws. I think we can all agree on that. Um, but what it did do it, is it, it got us thinking about the future outlook for renewable energy in South Africa. The IRP 2023 draft provided two horizons the next seven years to 2030, and then the long-term view between 2030 and 2050. Um, we're told that a new iteration is being worked on uh, by the department, so that's good news. But you know what we have understood from this draft is that the majority, almost 60% of new generation capacity is gonna come from wind and solar. That is the basis of, of the, uh, the modeling as it stands. The South African Renewable Energy Grid Survey was also conducted this time, this year for the second time. Uh, and this was conducted by ourselves, so where our partners, SAPIA and uh, NTCSA. Uh, and this, this exercise highlighted that there are 133 gigawatts of wind and solar PV projects currently under development in the country. Around 60 gigawatts is ready for implementation in the next three to five years. The caveat here is, grid capacity depend. Right? So in the next five years, we can have 60 gigawatts of renewables if we get the grid infrastructure right, if we get the, the mechanisms right. So colleagues, in your closing remarks, let's think about the, the outlook, what the policy is telling us, what market is telling us from the grid survey. Brian, if I can ask that we keep responses very short because we're running out of time, but Brian, you know, what is the confidence from private sector that government will get this IRP right and fit for purpose as we move forward? The vision, I think there's a, an increasing um, confidence. Uh, NECOM 2.0, the restructuring of that, building on what I said around getting the ERA through, um, I, I think the, the confidence is, is growing. Um, I would suggest, though, that the ERA, the unbundling of ESC and the progress there, the market codes, all of that is actually going to surpass the role of an IRP. Um, and the IRP, I think, needs to be seen differently. It, 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 for a long time, as SAIPA, we've said it should not be prescriptive, but rather an insight and a tool, especially for in conjunction with what the system operator is actually seeing on the grid to, to fill the gaps in, in the market because you've got long lead times, big investments, and you've got the different characteristics of electricity between energy, storage, backup, uh, and, and the functionality of, of the, the, um, the, the RP. So I think the work that the Energy Council has kicked off to make a, a publicly available version of that is, is really beneficial because both the modeling methodology and the boundary conditions are then debated and, and public. And I, and I think that's where the, where, where the rubber hits the road. Um, I, I think the other key issue is, is around the rules for grid allocation. 
because it cannot be a, 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 a bun fight between public and private. It, it has to be a way that we, we, we work out a way that within the project development um, pipeline and project developers, as you will know, uh, are, are masters of parallel process. You cannot then put a series process after all the parallel processes. It, it, it doesn't work in an electric circuit and it, and it doesn't work in the timeline of, of project development. So, so we have to find a way. I, I think having the, the, the CEL Pro or the programmatic CEL is, is profoundly useful and, and, and what it essentially does, because right back in 2012, we, we identified that a, a CEL that is done, and in that, a CEL cost estimate letter, three letter acronyms, um, that is only done independent of the other applications that are being done, as when there are so many new projects coming on stream versus what was happening at the beginning of REAP, um, is no longer fit for purpose. A, programmat a programmatic CEL is, is really good because it takes the geographic location of, of competing plants into, into consideration. The NTCSA then knows where grid strengthening is necessary on a shared basis, going back to your point, Carl, around, around how we how develop the nodes. The RPP office can, can even look at how the, 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 the rules are changed to procure at nodes. So, so, so once you've then got, got those processes, but I would caution against separating um, a, a, a CL Pro just for public procurement or just for private procurement. There's no rational basis for that. Um, we need both to happen at the same time. We need the, the power on the grid because as much as we've got 160 whatever days, and I'll add my, my admiration to Eskom, Nikon, and all the people doing doing the outstanding work behind the scenes. The, the, the reality is that even with the deferment of some of the coal-fired power stations to 2035 in 20, instead of 2030, we've still got, I think the number is 22 gigawatts of coal, which means something like 60 gigawatts of renewables capacity versus energy that's got to be built in the next 10 years. Um, you were talking about it, Coral, and even if you add the, the REAP numbers that Bernard was talking to, to the to the private sector numbers and all sizes, Eskom's, Eskom's uh, numbers call it rooftop, but it's actually all non-REAP. Um, we, we've got an, a massive challenge, but it's also an opportunity, um, as Bernard says, because it's, it's industrialization, it's localization, it's manufacturing, it's job creation, it's prosperity for our people. Thank you very much, Brian. Uh, I think that the point is clear, we need to get the processes right. Uh, and we need to be able to work together to 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 find the, the transparency and fairness in those processes. Thank you very much. Carol, you know, you know, given the market reform and energy mix under review, what is the critical factor, the one critical factor that will influence the trajectory of renewable energy investment? Yeah, um, so it's a it's a really difficult question. And I would bring it down to global learning rates of technology. So um, I think with all technologies, uh, there is a, a learning rate associated with them. And so the more you roll out a specific technology, the cheaper it will become. So, so the world will sort of decide which technologies are leading the race and those technologies will become cheaper and cheaper and cheaper over time. And I think therefore the mix will change as a result of what has happened on a, on, on a global basis. Um, so I think we all have seen over the last two or three years how significantly the, the price of solar panels have declined. I think the cost of um, battery cells have almost half over a period of 12 to 18 months. And these are dramatic movements in the cost of technology. So maybe when you would have done an IRP um, 24 months ago um, and you were to do it today, the answer is going to change. And I think it's again going to change three years from now and five years from now. So I think we all need to realize we live in a very dynamic environment and it's not only a south african game i mean we are a player in a global um transition to a new energy future and i think as um, as those things um, play out it will give us clues as to what the best technologies are to commit to at a, at a specific point in time 
absolutely. It's a global game that we have to find game. our part in. Thank you so much, Carol. Uh, Bernard, I've given you numbers from the IRP, given you numbers from the grid survey. By your analysis, how much of this is real? How much of growth will we actually see in the next five years? And how will, how will the public procurement program, you know, from this foundation around this growth that we do? Yeah, that's a, that's a difficult question, Nivesh. Um, I mean, I wish I could I could uh, give you the numbers, but I, I think what we can agree is that um, we need more than we can build at the current rate. Uh, if you look at transmission capacity that's available today, uh, we're probably sitting with less than 15 gigawatt to connect. Um, and we've got a deficit if one takes the worst case scenario last year, we have got a deficit of at least six gigawatt of base load, which equated to times three, if you now translate that into renewables. So I think if we don't sort out the grid solutions, and, and I had somebody talking about 800 kilometers in the two, three years, um, we have to be serious. <laughs> We have to be serious. I did mention in the opening that the ERA Amendment Act give us a lot of opportunities. And, and we as the IPP office are already, uh, you know, doing feasibilities of some of the solutions uh, that, that have been talked about. But I mean, we'll make the announcement at the right time. But yeah, it, I think at the current rate, um, given the grid uh, development plans, uh, we've got a serious challenge ahead of us. Uh, and, and we need to do, you know, we need a, a step change in, in grid, um, grid uh, construction and grid development in South Africa. So there is no answer, unfortunately, that I can give you, Nivesh. But uh, all I can say is that we are aware of the challenge and we stand ready should there be, you know, an opportunity for us to implement other measures to make sure that we expedite the rollout of, of, of um new generation capacity. Absolutely, no, thank you for that. I said up front that I was gonna ask the difficult questions uh, and put you guys on the hot seat. Uh, Heather, you'll have the last word of the panel. And I think it's, a, it's an extremely important. So you know, with the changes and the growth uh, we're, we're anticipating, this must support further development of impact, right? And when I talk impact, we talk local participation and beneficiation um, here, homegrown, where we can see the beneficiation happening uh, within the country. What approach should we adopt to develop South Africa's renewable energy value chain to support local participation and beneficiation? Thank you. So for me, it is kind of, I've kind of focused on kind of four key areas, which I think will really change and will move the dial. I, I think there is a big uh, need to develop local manufacturing capabilities uh, for all of the uh, solutions that we've talked about, so solar, wind, and battery storage. Um, currently, many of the components are imported, uh, and I think establishing domestic production could really reduce costs, create jobs, uh, and obviously make us more self-sufficient when it comes to that value chain. Um, I think government can support this by, you know, increasing incentives uh, and subsidies for those local uh, manufacturers. We know, you know, if I take tire manufacturing just as an example, uh, you know, actually supporting some of those industries to, to, to make the conversion. Uh, I think there's also under that element, uh, uh, you know, an objective to look at how we encourage black participation and ownership as we go through that journey uh, and making sure that, um, you know, the, the large organizations have a privileged position where they could support incubation of, of those types of organizations. The second one for me is supply chain and infrastructure development. I think we've talked a lot about the challenges that face our infrastructure at the moment. Um, but I think there's also uh, the services that sit around that, you know, like the logistics of moving some of that stuff around. Um, some of the permitting processes in order to get some of that live. Uh, I think that, you know, is something that we should be looking at. How can we accelerate some of that? 
The next one is skills development. And I think there was a question in the Q&A around labor risk. Uh, we know that we're losing our top talent internationally, but I also think it's not necessarily a natural skill set that you know we have been training for. So scaling up skills training in renewable energy technology, I think is essential. Uh, and I think it's going to take partnership between business, government, and academic institutions to actually start to, to train workers to install, manage, and maintain renewable energy solutions. Um, and I think two of the universities, University of Stellenbosch and UCT, are already pioneering programs in renewable energy engineering. We need more of that um, in order to, to meet the demand of, of, of these types of skills and capabilities. And then the last one is really financing and investment. I think it's about creating blended finance models where, and we talked a lot about public and private capital, um, but I think that we're going to have to look at different ways of doing that as, as the scale grows. You know, we're going to see, we're seeing sort of philanthropic uh, funding flows coming into the, the country. We're seeing government funding flows come into the country. And I think it's really thinking about how we can uh, maximize the effectiveness of those, but also how we can potentially consolidate. Because I was chatting to a colleague uh, who's the head of sustainable finance for Bank of America. And unfortunately, many of the projects that we've got are not individually big enough for them to invest in. And so it's how can we start to aggregate some of those projects that make them sort of internationally interesting. Thank you very much, Heather. Uh, I'm told we are officially out of time. So unfortunately, we won't be able to address the, the question and answers. I hope that the, you know, the session has provided a lot of the information you would, were looking for. Uh, for those of you who want more information, particularly around the public procurement program, the IPP office website is a great resource. Uh, the quarterly report will give you exactly what technologies, exactly where they built, uh, the locations, the investment, the socioeconomic development. So please have a look at that. Wind energy um, information specifically, the Sawyer website is available. Please have a look. Uh, and then with that, I would like to thank the panelists for their expert opinions and insights. An extremely important conversation, you know, to ensure that we are aligned as we embrace the electricity market evolution. Uh, we have taken stock of what we have achieved. We are integrating changes as we reform and have a view of where we are going to in the short, medium, and long term, investing in renewable in our renewable energy future. I look forward to seeing many of you at the Windaba conference uh, that's happening first to the 4th of October in Cape Town. Please come say hello. Um, and with that, I would like to hand back, uh, as I hand back to, to Shannon, uh, I am Nivesh and Gavinder, wishing you a great day. Thanks so much, Nivesh. That brings us to the end of our webinar. I would like to take this opportunity to say thank you to you, Nivesh and Govinda, for facilitating and enabling such an engaging discussion. Thank you also to our panelists, Carl Cornelison from NOAA Group, Bernard Magoral from the Independent Power Producers Office, Brian Day from the South African Independent Power Producers Association, and Heather Orton from EY Parthenon. Thank you to our sponsors, NOAA Group and EY, for their support in making this webinar possible. And finally, thank you to the attendees for taking the time to join us for this discussion on South Africa's Renewable Energy Report Card and Investment Outlook. We hope you found this event engaging and informative. We appreciate your attendance. Our next webinar takes place on the 9th of October at 2 p.m. and will focus on the hydrogen economy. The link to register for that event has been shared in the chat. The recording of today's webinar will be sent to you in due course. And if you have any additional questions, please be in touch. You can reach us at shannon at creamamedia.co.za. Thank you, everyone.